Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. All right, we're going to wait just another minute or two to let people trickle in and then we'll get started. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. It's another session of some people being here in person and some people being on the computer, but it's good to see you all. I have one announcement before we get started. Um, so we have our social epidemiology certificate that we launched last year. And based on feedback that we got from students, this year we are launching a social entrepreneurship conversation series. And the goal of this is to inform students of opportunities in the site for addressing social determinants of health. So we will be inviting guest speakers to join in a structured but in conversation to discuss the roles that someone with training in social epidemiology could play in their field or business. So our first conversation will be on October 13th from 4 to 5 p.m. We've invited Dr. Emil Kanarni from the Roth School of Business to come. And so we um, have an open only to CSF students and students in the certificate program. So we're hoping to keep it contained. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know and we will send out a formal announcement later this week. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Anon, who will be presenting. Thanks, Abigail. Um, so as I pull the slides up, um, I just want to say that I'm using this talk today to get some feedback um, on my dissertation oral defense that I'm actually doing in about two weeks. So any feedback that you have on either the flow or too much information, not enough information or the slides itself, um, I welcome any of that. And I know we're a bit short on time. So if you wanna connect afterwards as well, either email, or offline in any way, I'd be happy to do that as well. So I'm really using this as a dry run to get some feedback um, on the process. Okay, let me just pull up my slides. Um, is everyone able to see the slides? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you everyone for attending my practice talk for my oral dissertation defense in the Department of Epidemiology. Today I'll be presenting on my work titled Successful Aging into the 21st Century, Features of the Neighborhood, Features of the Neighborhood Environment as Facilitators or Barriers for Individuals Aging with Disability. I'll start by talking about what I mean when I say a population aging with disability. I'll then discuss some of the data sources and the cohort creation used in my work. I'll delve into the findings for AIMS 1, 2, and 3, and bring it all together by talking about the public health and clinical implications. So as most of you are aware, the US population is aging. As you can see here on the X axis, um, where you have the year and the Y axis, where you have the population, about 15% of the current population is 65 or over, but over the next three decades, it's expected to increase to about 23%. And this has implications for um, disability as well. So while currently about 13 to 26% of the population has a sensory, physical, intellectual, or self-care disability, if you look at this infographic where on the X we have the age and on the Y the percentage of population, amongst those 65 and over, about 35% of them have some sort of disability. 
But as I'll note over the next few slides, those with the cumulative effects of entering old age with a disability that you acquire earlier in life is distinct from a disability that you acquire as a result of the aging process. And in the gerontology and disability literature, these represent two distinct populations one aging with a disability and one aging into disability. So when I say aging with disability, I'm talking about a group of individuals who develop their disability at birth, in childhood, or within the first four to five decades of life and are now entering older ages with that disability. This includes physical disabilities like cerebral palsy or spina bifida, intellectual disabilities like Down syndrome, as well as sensory disabilities like vision loss. And it's expected that the prevalence in the U.S. is upwards of 21%. Their increased longevity is attributed to medical and technological advancements, public health measures, as well as policies at the state and federal level. However, the variability in their disability onset and trajectory makes them a distinct subset of older adults with a disability. For example, we know those aging with disability are more likely to be female, Black or Hispanic, and spend fewer years married. Work done by doctors Clark and Latham using data from the panel study of income dynamics found that compared to individuals who have later onset disability or who have no disability at all, those aging with disability were less likely to have obtained a college degree, less likely to be employed, and they had persistently lower household income, and it was most marked during midlife. So as you can imagine, this has implications for savings, retirement, and later life health. In fact, individuals aging with disability report worse self-rated health than their counterparts uh, with no disability or late onset disability. Traditionally, our understanding of disability, healthcare access, and quality of care, including continuity of care, which I'll talk about later, have really existed in silos. So the most common model of disability is the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, which looks at that the disablement process as some kind of impairment in body function or structure that limits activities, which we think of as disability, and overall impacts your participation in society. The most common model of access to care is the Adey and Anderson model, which thinks of access as being driven by need, predisposing and enabling factors. But it's been limited in its focus on need and predisposing factors as opposed to enabling factors which tend to focus on the broader structural environment. More recently, me and colleagues proposed the model of healthcare disparities and disability. And it's aimed at reconciling these different models and addressing their limitations. It essentially stipulates that access to care allows for an individual with disability to manage their condition such that it improves later life health. And importantly, it focuses on the role of the environment in facilitating that. However, there's limitations in that it has not been quantitatively assessed yet. In older adults with mobility impairments, the role of the environment has generally focused on participation and physical activity. So we know that greater land mixed use, greater number of destinations and open space has been associated with greater physical, occupational and social participation. Furthermore, um, transportation, accessibility of recreational facilities and their aesthetics has been associated with greater physical activity and features of the built environment like curb cuts or places to rest has also been associated with physical activity. So amongst older adults with mobility impairments, community level factors are important for participation and mobility. But for those aging with disability, the environment may be particularly important given their cumulative disadvantage, limited mobility, and the ways in which they interact with their environment. But most of the studies in this population have really focused on the physical and psychosocial characteristics. So we know very little about the role of the environment in facilitating positive health outcomes and quality of care for this population. Therefore, the overall goal of my dissertation is to address this limitation in the literature. I do so in AIM-1 by investigating the relationship between features of the neighborhood environment and development of cardiometabolic disease. In AIM-2, I switch over to characterizing quality of care using continuity of care in individuals with disability, and then identify the individual and community level factors that are associated with continuity of care. And then in the third AIM, I look at the relationship between continuity of care and health outcomes, both chronic disease and screening. So now I wanna take a bit of time to talk about the data sources that I used and how I created the study cohort. 
I utilized Optum Clinformatics Data Mart in order to identify the population aging with physical disability. I also used this data source to identify individual level demographic characteristics and health outcomes. Optum contains de-identified information for over 80 million unique individuals who are on a single private health insurance plan. Every individual is provided a unique identifier, which allows for them to be followed longitudinally over time, even if there's a lapse in coverage or if the terms of their coverage change. In addition, there's geographic identifiers that are provided with the smallest one being the residential zip code. However, when researchers are provided residential zip code information, we are not given individual level income, education, or race to protect the privacy of patients on the plan. I utilized International Classification of Diseases ninth edition codes in order to identify individuals with the following physically disabling conditions, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, multiple sclerosis, and plasia when they were at least 18 years of age. Now, cerebral palsy and spina bifida are congenital conditions, so individuals are born with them, whereas multiple sclerosis and plasia are considered acquired conditions, so individuals develop them sometime in later life. In line with traditional definitions of aging with disability, for the acquired conditions, individuals had to have their qualifying uh, disability diagnosis by the age of 50 years. This is a schematic of how I created the cohort, and there's some slight variations by aim, but I will highlight those as I get to them. Generally speaking, individuals had to have at least four years of continuous enrollment on the plan to ensure stable membership and to allow for adequate follow-up time. One year within this enrollment window was used as a look back window to ascertain disease history, prevalent conditions, and for those with acquired disability to ensure that it was an incident diagnosis. And then the remaining time was used for outcome ascertainment. So the date of diagnosis of their disability that met this criteria was used as the index date for entry into the cohort. There was just over 26,000 individuals in this cohort and about 58% of them had a diagnosis of cerebral palsy or spina bifida. The average age was 44 years. There were some individuals over the age of 50, but they were exclusively in the cerebral palsy and spina bifida um, group. And 60% of individuals were female. Data on features of the neighborhood environment was obtained from the National Neighborhood Data Archive, or NANDA. NANDA is a publicly available data archive that contains contextual measures at various spatial scales. I define neighborhood based on a person's residential zip code, and I had updated information on their residential zip code so I could assign them to updated information on their neighborhood environments. Now, it's important to note that zip codes are actually postal routes designated by the US Postal Service, whereas data in NANDA is at the zip code tabulation area or ZICTA level, which are spatial representations of zip codes. And they're not a one-to-one -one match, so I did have to use a crosswalk file in order to assign individuals to their neighborhood exposures. Distinct from just a measure of density of neighborhood features, I also included measures of the spatial accessibility of healthcare providers, namely family physicians, nurse practitioners, chiropractors, and medical specialists. These were provided at the ZICTA level by Naylor and colleagues. The formula that they used to compute this is shown in the blue box on the right, but it generally has two components. One is a distance decay weight, and the other one is a provider to population ratio, which is just the availability of healthcare providers. It has distinct advantages from just per capita measures, including it doesn't assume that you have equal access just because you live in the same ZICTA. It also accounts for boundary effects, meaning that it assumes that people don't just use healthcare providers within these arbitrary boundaries. And because of the distance decay weight, it accounts for the fact that providers that are further away tend to be less accessible. So now I'll talk a bit about the findings of, main, of AIM-1. Individuals aging with disability are at increased risk of cardiometabolic disease. So these are your traditional cardiovascular diseases, but also type two diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Peterson and colleagues aim to quantify the three-year risk of any cardiometabolic disease amongst individuals aging with cerebral palsy or spina bifida, shown in the blue, and controls, shown in the red. Across the X, you have the days, and across the Y, you have survival probability, so being event-free. And so we see that individuals with cerebral palsy and spina bifida are less likely to be disease-free. In fully adjusted models, the risk of any cardiometabolic disease is 52% higher amongst those with cerebral palsy and spina bifida compared to their controls. Many of you are probably aware of the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, including diet, physical activity, smoking, and adiposity. But what about the places where we live, work, and play? 
while a more recent paradigm is aimed to examine the role of the environment in cardiovascular risk. Work by Unger and colleagues looked at various features of the neighborhood environment, which you see here on the x-axis, with greater quartiles indicative of better health, and cardiovascular health on the y-axis, with higher scores indicative of better cardiovascular health. And we see in bivariate analysis that better neighborhood environments were associated with better cardiovascular health. Similarly, work by Christine and colleagues looked at the subjective and objective neighborhood environment and found that neighborhoods that were rated as being subjectively better in terms of healthy food resources and recreational establishments, individuals in those neighborhoods had lower risk of type 2 diabetes. But findings from the general population may not translate to those aging with disability, owing to the inaccessibility of some of these features and differences in how they interact with their environment and limited mobility. Furthermore, these studies have really only looked at a narrow subset of neighborhood features, but there may be additional features that are important for individuals aging with a physical disability. To address these limitations, the first aim of my dissertation examines the relationship between features of the neighborhood environment and development of cardiometabolic disease. I investigate the relationship between specific features of the neighborhood environment and risk of cardiometabolic disease. I hypothesize that individuals residing in neighborhoods with a high density of recreational facilities, parks, broadband internet connections, and transit would have lower cardiometabolic risk. And then I examine the relationship between a composite measure of health promoting features and health harming infrastructure and incident cardiometabolic disease. I hypothesize that individuals living in neighborhoods with a high density of health promoting resources compared to low density would have a lower risk of cardiometabolic disease, while those living in neighborhoods with a higher density of health harming features would have higher risk of cardiometabolic disease. These are the features of the environment that I looked at and they were obtained from Nanda. So the healthcare environment consisted of healthcare resources like hospitals and ambulatory care centers. And the broader healthcare environment also consisted of broadband internet connections, as it may be a form of accessing health information and telehealth services, as well as transit stops, which was a marker of transit availability, as it may afford individuals an opportunity to gain access to care. The broader food and recreation environment consisted of recreational establishments, parks, and grocery stores. I also looked at liquor, tobacco, and convenience stores, and fast food restaurants. So these were all density measures and operationalized as turtiles. The healthcare environment and the food and recreation environment formed my overall composite measure of health promoting resources, while liquor, tobacco, and convenience stores and fast food restaurants form my composite measure of health harming infrastructure. I utilized ICD-9 and 10 codes in order to identify a diagnosis of any cardiometabolic disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, or hyperlipidemia in Optum over three years of follow-up. These conditions were selected owing to their relationship with the environment in the general population. I categorized these as a binary variable based on whether there was a diagnosis during follow-up, and I, the main outcome was essentially time to diagnosis of these conditions. I used time varying Cox proportional hazards models to account for people changing neighborhood environments over time, as well as changes in their neighborhood features. I ran separate models for each of the outcome measures and also ran a series of models, including the focal neighborhood feature of interest. The individual and neighborhood level variables that I adjusted the models for are shown here on the slide. I accounted for clustering at the Zikta level using robust standard errors and computed hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals. Overall, the three-year incidence of any cardiometabolic disease was high in this population. So about 40% of individuals had a diagnosis of any cardiometabolic disease. Amongst the specific conditions examined, hypertension was the most common, followed by hyperlipidemia and type 2 diabetes. The next set of slides will show you the main regression analyses for the outcome of any cardiometabolic disease. Across the top, you'll see the model and the focal variables of interest, and then I present the hazard ratios and confidence intervals. As a note, the reference category is low. So for example, in model one, I included the healthcare resources such as hospitals and ambulatory care centers, and we see that those living in neighborhoods with a moderate density of these healthcare resources had a 6% lower risk of any cardiometabolic disease, and it was marginally significant. 
In model two, I added in the broader uh, healthcare environment, so broadband internet and transit stops. So we see that healthcare resources are no longer independently significant, but individuals living in neighborhoods with a high density of broadband internet connections had a 12% lower risk of any cardiometabolic disease compared to those who lived in areas with a low density. Similarly, those who lived in areas with a high density of transit stops had an 11% lower risk of any cardiometabolic disease, and this was statistically significant. I then looked at the broader uh, food and recreation environment, and you see that individuals living in neighborhoods with a high density of recreation establishments had a 11% lower risk of any cardiometabolic disease. And for those living in a high density of parks, they had a 12% lower risk of any cardiometabolic disease with a dose response relationship observed. I then looked at the composite measures and we see that individuals living in neighborhoods with a high density of health promoting resources had a 14% lower risk of any cardiometabolic disease, but no significant findings were observed for the composite of health harming features. When I looked at the specific components of cardiometabolic disease, I generally noted similar findings uh, with the exception of hyperlipidemia. So recreational facilities and parks were generally protective for these cardiometabolic conditions with the exception um, of uh, type two diabetes, transit availability was also protective. Some features were not found to be associated with cardiometabolic disease, including healthcare resources, especially when you added in the transit and um, broadband internet connection variables. Generally speaking, the health promoting variable was protective. So those who lived in areas with high density of health promoting resources had lower risk of these conditions and no significant findings were observed across any of these conditions for the health harming variable. So overall, the neighborhood environment is important for the development of cardiometabolic disease. I noted that recreational establishments were found to be protective, which makes sense given that they offer these, this population an opportunity to engage in physical activity. Parks were also independently protective, and that could be because recreational facilities, especially some of them, remain inaccessible for this population. So parks afford another venue in which to engage in physical activity. Transit was also found to be protective, which may allow this population to be able to access healthcare resources as well as recreational establishments. Broadband internet was found to be protective as it may afford an opportunity for telehealth services, health information, as well as for opportunities to work. And we know that socioeconomic status is important um, as a protective factor against cardiometabolic disease. Healthcare facilities were not found to be independently associated, and it could suggest that it's actually the other features of the environment that shape health behaviors that are important for cardiometabolic risk before someone contacts the healthcare system, or perhaps it's actually not the density of these resources per se, but rather the experiences that people have within the healthcare system and the quality of care they receive that's important. There was generally an alignment between the individual neighborhood features and the composite measure, and overall, I did not find any significant findings for health harming features, and it could be that many of these aspects are found to be inaccessible for individuals aging with disability, despite what's laid out in the Americans with Disability Act, which may mean that there's a bit of a protective effect um, there and blunted effect against the harmful features. This study does present with several strengths. So first I utilized a longitudinal study design. So I was better able to look at the temporal relationship between the neighborhood and health. I also accounted for features such as age and comorbid conditions, which may in indicate individuals selecting into certain neighborhoods. And I was able to get updated information on people's neighborhood environments, which could mitigate some misclassification of the exposure. However, I was unable to actually look at the quality of the environment. So even if individuals are living in neighborhoods with a high density of recreational facilities, if those are actually of poor quality, then they may be underestimating the protective effects of these recreational facilities. Future studies should supplement this with Google Street View in order to look at the quality of the environmental features. I also wasn't able to assess whether individuals actually use these establishments, which makes the causal link a bit difficult to ascertain, and future qualitative work should assess how individuals interact with these features and their use to inform formal mediation analysis looking at the direct and indirect effects of the neighborhood feature and cardiometabolic disease. 
So in AIM-1, I was looking at the relationship between the neighborhood and health, and I noted that healthcare resources on their own were not protective, which may suggest that it's the quality of care experiences that individuals have within the healthcare system, which is important to consider. And while I wasn't able to examine this in AIM-2, that was the focus of, sorry, AIM-1, that was the focus of AIM-2 of my dissertation. Individuals aging with physical disability have to manage not just their primary disability and receiving preventative care recommended for the general population, but they're also at increased risk for these secondary health conditions that stem directly or indirectly from their primary disability, and they're at increased risk of common age-related chronic conditions that occur as a result of cumulative exposure to environmental factors and lifestyle factors. So it makes them a complex care population. At the same time, individuals with disabilities are known to receive poor quality care and often face barriers to accessing care. Jackson has summarized these into getting to healthcare facilities, getting in and navigating facilities, clarifying their healthcare needs, whether their doctor is available or not, and feeling like they have to overcome predisposed attitudes as someone with a disability. The first two pertain specifically to features of the neighborhood environment. So when you think about them being a complex care population and facing barriers to accessing care, you can imagine that they have the potential to receive fragmented care. And that's why studying continuity of care is important in this population. Continuity of care is a measure of quality of care, and it deals with an enduring relationship between an individual and their healthcare provider. The underlying premise is that if an individual has this continuous relationship with a set of providers, they're better able to serve their needs and provide better quality care because they understand their needs better. And it's been studied in a variety of complex care populations. In the general population, they've identified a lot of individual and clinical level factors that are associated with continuity of care, like age and comorbid conditions, but there's limited information on contextual factors. One study which did look at the relationship between features of the environment and continuity of care in a population with schizophrenia found that higher density of mental health facilities and practicing psychologists was associated with more continuous care. But they were limited in the variables that they could examine because they used census data. So there may be additional features of the neighborhood environment that are particularly important for individuals aging with physical disability. And we also know that this population is understudied in terms of continuity of care because only one study to my knowledge, a pediatric population with cerebral palsy in Taiwan has actually characterized continuity of care. So there's a big gap in the literature in this regard. To address this, the second aim of my dissertation looks to characterize continuity of care in individuals aging with disability and identify the individual and community level factors that are associated with it. First, I aim to characterize continuity of care patterns in this population, and I hypothesize that they would have low continuity of care, and for those who were characterized as having low continuity of care, they would see a variety of different healthcare specialties. I then wanted to examine the relationship between individual and community level factors and continuous care. And I hypothesize that living in neighborhoods with the high density of healthcare facilities, transit and broadband would be associated with more continuous care net of individual level factors. I leveraged the same cohort that I created in AIM-1, except that because this was a cross-sectional study design, I only used the first year post-index, so that's when I computed the continuity of care measure and looked at the neighborhood exposures. The primary outcome was the bice boxerman Continuity of Care Index, which is a measure of care continuity, and it's the extent to which visits are concentrated with a single provider. The formula used to compute it is shown in the box in blue, and it has two primary components. So the first is the number of outpatient visits with a given provider, and then it's the total number of visits that you have in a given year. The score ranges from zero to one. So if all of your visits are concentrated amongst a single provider, you have a score of one, which is perfect continuity. And if all your visits are with a different provider, you have a score of zero, considered to be fragmented care. You're required to have at least four visits to have stable estimates, so I did have to exclude individuals who did not have at least four outpatient visits in that year. And because the score in of itself has no inherent meaning, I had to categorize it into a binary variable. Scores above the median were considered high continuity, and those at or below the median were considered low continuity. This slide details the individual and contextual factors that I looked at and the data set they came from. So the individual level variables came from Optum, Nanda was used for the built environment, and then the spatial accessibility variables came from the Naylor data set. 
I used a cross-sectional study design and I used, created separate regression models for each of the outcomes. I used logistic regression um, and I modeled the odds of high continuity of care. And I accounted for clustering at the Zigta level using generalized estimating equations. In model one, I added the individual level characteristics and in model two, I subsequently added the community level characteristics. This table details the median continuity of care score, which ranges from 0.21 for those with MS to 0.25 for those with CP and spina bifida. Across those with low continuity of care scores, the mean scores were generally consistent, but amongst those characterized as having high continuity of care, there was greater variability in their mean scores. In bivariate analysis, high continuity was associated with older age, being male, and having a lower disease burden. I then wanted to look at the different types of specialties they see. So here, this is specifically for CP and spina bifida, but similar findings were observed for the other conditions as well. Across the x-axis, you have whether they were characterized as having low or high continuity, and across the y, you have the percent of total visits to different types of specialists. We see that they saw a variety of different specialty types over the year, and notably, those with high continuity of care had a greater proportion of their visits concentrated amongst fewer different specialty types. So about 55% of the visits for those with high continuity were amongst family physicians or internal medicine doctors, compared to those with low continuity where it was about 45%. Those with low continuity saw a variety of different specialists that included orthopedics, nurse practitioners, and obstetrics or gynecologists. The next set of slides will walk you through the main regression analyses. So I'm focusing just on model two and I'm presenting just the results for the community level characteristics, but they are adjusted for the individual level variables as well. So each of these is the point estimate and the confidence intervals. And I'm, again, I'm modeling the odds of high continuity of care. The red arrows indicate significant findings and the reference group is high. So for example, those living in less affluent areas had 55% higher odds of continuous care compared to those living in more affluent areas. Conversely, those living in areas with a moderate density of hospitals had 0.84 times the odds of continuous care compared to those living in areas with a high density of hospitals. Significant findings were also observed for spatial accessibility of family physicians, as well as density of skilled and residential nursing facilities. Amongst those with plasia, I noted that those who lived in areas with a moderate density of accessibility of medical specialists had 25% higher odds of continuous care compared to those living in areas with a high density of these medical specialists. And significant findings were also observed for transit stops and internet connections. And then for multiple sclerosis, significant findings were only observed for density of broadband internet connections. So those living in areas with lower density of broadband internet connections had 44% higher odds of continuous care than those living in areas with a high density. So overall, I found that this population did have low continuity of care scores. It ranged from 0.21 to 0.25. And as you can see in this table here, compared to other complex care populations, these scores are lower, including a pediatric population with uh, cerebral palsy. They were also likely to see a wide range of healthcare providers. In particular, those with high continuity had most of their visits concentrated amongst primary care providers. And that makes sense given that primary care providers are thought of as gatekeepers and they only refer out to other specialists when really necessary. So if that's the individual that you see for most of your care, it's likely that a greater proportion of your visits would be concentrated amongst those specialties. I also found community level factors to be important. So those living in less affluent areas had more concentrated care. We know that affluence is associated with health literacy as well as broader structural factors and social networks that may promote individuals to seek care from different providers due to shopping around behaviors and that can result in more fragmented care. We also know that providers don't practice at random and they're generally located in more popular in uh, areas with higher affluence because of discretionary income. So again, that gives you more access to healthcare providers, which may result in fragmented care. This could also explain the patterns we observe for individuals living in areas with lower density of broadband internet connections, transit, and spatial accessibility of healthcare providers. Those living in areas with lower density of healthcare facilities had lower odds of continuous care. And it could be because these facilities offer opportunities to have access to care managers who can help you navigate the healthcare system resulting in less uh, fragmented care. 
His study addressed a novel research question because there was limited information looking at continuity of care in this population, and I was also able to account for boundary effects. However, I did have to restrict the study population to those with at least four visits, so the population could either be those who are able to access care or those who have greater care needs. It could also result in internal validity concerns if we know that you're selecting for a population who lives in better environments and is better able to seek care, so you may be overestimating that relationship. The vice boxerman measure also doesn't account for patient preferences and shopping around behaviors, even though it sort of underlies that premise. So future studies should aim to examine how shopping around behavior may help explain some of the patterns observed in this study. So in AIM-2, I noted that this population has low continuity of care scores, so more fragmented care. I also noted that they saw a variety of different healthcare providers. And in the general population, high continuity has been associated with positive health and health system outcomes. So they tend to have lower chronic disease burden, lower mortality, less avoidable hospitalizations, less healthcare spending, and fewer duplicated prescriptions. But we also know that individuals aging with disability have complex healthcare needs. So maybe they need to see a variety of different healthcare providers in order to appropriately meet their healthcare needs. Which begs the question, does the conceptualization hold true in this population as well? Well, there's limited evidence amongst individuals with disabilities. So one pediatric population from Taiwan found that low continuity was associated with higher medical costs and greater number of days in the hospital. Amongst individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Florida and Ontario, Canada, high continuity was associated with lower odds of pap smears and high continuity was associated with lower risk of emergency department visits. But across these studies, they were only able to look at a limited number of preventative screenings, largely focused on female populations. And while they focused a lot on health systems outcomes, which are important for sustainability, it's also important to look at quality of health, such as health metrics like uh, chronic disease as well. They also didn't account for a lot of comorbid um, conditions as well as neighborhood features, such as features of the neighborhood environment. And so you could have residual confounding. And lastly, there may be distinct challenges that are experienced by individuals who are aging with a physical disability that can't be captured even amongst a pediatric population with cerebral palsy. So to address these limitations, the third aim of my dissertation looks at the relationship between continuity of care and health outcomes. First, I wanted to assess the association between continuity of care and chronic secondary health conditions and preventative screening. And I hypothesized that high continuity would be inversely associated with the diagnosis of chronic secondary health condition and lower odds of receiving a uh, screening. And then I wanted to see whether these findings differed across older and younger adults aging with disability. And I hypothesized that the findings would be stronger for those younger adults because of the importance of early screening and care continuity for younger populations aging with disability. The primary exposure here was the vice boxerman continuity of care index that I created earlier, and again, I operationalized it as a binary variable. I looked at the following primary outcomes. So I looked at chronic secondary health conditions, namely mood disorders, pain, hypertension, and diabetes. And these were identified in Optum using ICD-9 and 10 codes. And then I also looked at preventative screenings, namely cholesterol and diabetes, which were identified using procedural codes in Optum. I selected these groups of outcomes because they're important metrics for those aging with disability. So chronic secondary health conditions are technically avoidable for this population with appropriate care. And preventative screenings are an important quality of care metric given that they're recommended for the general population. And these are more proximal measures to continuity of care. I ran condition-specific analyses. For type 2 diabetes and hypertension, I ran Cox proportional hazards models. And then for screening, mood, and pain, I looked at logistic regression models. I adjusted for the individual and neighborhood level factors that you see here on the screen, and I did account for clustering at the Zikta level. These models were run in the overall cohort as well as stratified by age, so less than 40 and over 40, and these cutoffs were driven largely by screening recommendations. One thing to note is that as individuals are in the process of getting a diagnosis, they may be seeing a variety of different healthcare providers and getting various referrals, and that can actually result in lower continuity of care, so you may have a concern with reverse causality. To mitigate that, I excluded individuals who had their primary diagnosis in the same year as the continuity of care score was calculated. So in year one, I computed the continuity of care score, and in years two and three, I looked at the outcomes. 
His first table here shows you the outcomes of secondary health conditions across the overall cohort by physically disabling um, condition. So we see that in the overall cohort, amongst individuals with MS, those with high continuity of care had 30% lower odds of a pain diagnosis, and it was statistically significant. In the overall cohort, no significant findings were observed for the other secondary health conditions across any of the disability types. I then stratified this by age. So in the top table, you have your younger cohort and the bottom table, you have your older cohort. And I noted that the findings for pain were largely driven by younger adults. So amongst younger adults with MS, high continuity of care was associated with 0.61 times the odds of a pain diagnosis. Um, and this was statistically significant. Amongst younger adults with plasia, high continuity was associated with 68% higher risk of hypertension. And amongst older adults, I noted that high continuity of care was associated with lower odds of a mood disorder diagnosis. The second table here looks at the overall cohort and the screening outcomes. So generally speaking, high continuity was associated with lower odds of screening. So for example, amongst individuals with plasia, high continuity of care was associated with 20% lower odds of receiving a cholesterol screening, and it was statistically significant. Again, in age stratified analysis, this finding was largely driven by the younger cohort. So amongst younger adults with plasia, high continuity was associated with 0.74 times the odds of receiving a cholesterol screening, but no significant findings uh, were observed in those older adults um, for cholesterol screening. So overall, I noted that high continuity was associated with lower odds of a pain diagnosis, especially in younger adults. And this could be that if your condition is better managed, you're less likely to have to see a healthcare provider for pain-related diagnosis. I also found that higher continuity was associated with lower odds of mood diagnosis in older adults. Again, this could be attributed to better management. And I found that high continuity was associated with increased risk of hypertension, and this was in younger adults. This could be a sign of a diagnosis of preclinical disease due to continuity of care. High continuity was inversely associated with preventative screening, and this could be actually a marker of more appropriate screening. So when you have fragmented care, you have more opportunities to have received a screening because every provider may want to give you a screening before they recommend any course of treatment. And these findings were generally driven by younger adults. This study employed several strengths, so the analytical technique used can help to mitigate some of the reverse causality concerns. I also did include several contextual variables which may mitigate um, some of the residual confounding. However, I was unable to look at whether individuals had preclinical disease because I was using claims data, which relies on diagnosis. And it is possible that this was differential across whether someone has high or low continuity of care. And most of the screening criteria were driven by age, but there are other reasons why someone might get a screening such as family history or adiposity, yet age continues to be a strong driver of initiating screening. So overall in AIM-1, I looked at the relationship between various features of the neighborhood environment and cardiometabolic disease. And I found that there were several features that were found to be protective like recreational facilities, parks, and broadband internet. However, healthcare facilities in of themselves were not significantly protective, suggesting that perhaps the quality of care is an important aspect to consider. So in AIM-2, I characterized continuity of care, which is a measure of quality of care, and looked at the individual and community level factors that are associated with it. I noted that features of the environment that allow for individuals to easily access a variety of different healthcare providers may result in more fragmented care, although it may better meet their healthcare preferences and needs. And then in AIM-3, I looked at the relationship between continuity of care and diagnosis of secondary health conditions and receipt of preventative screenings. And I found that generally speaking, high continuity was inversely associated with a diagnosis of uh, pain and mood disorders, and inversely related to receipt of preventative screenings. So taken in concert, this dissertation highlights that the role of the neighborhood environment is important for individuals aging with physical disability, but that the relationships are complex and nuanced. So findings from the general population can't necessarily translate to those who are aging with disability. The overall dissertation does have some strengths. So I used claims data, which afforded me a large national data source, especially to study some more rare conditions. I also had objective measures of the exposure and outcome, which may have mitigated exposure and outcome misclassification. And I was able to account for important neighborhood features specific to the population aging with disability so that policy implications are more relevant to this population. 
However, my use of private health insurance database could mean that this is not generalizable to the broader population who's aging with a physical disability. So future studies should also look at Medicare and Medicaid claims data to see if findings hold. This could also have resulted in internal validity concerns if I'm selecting a population that's likely to live in better environments and have better health. So these environmental features may actually appear more protective. I also lacked information on individual level sociodemographic characteristics, so residual confounding could be a concern, although these individual level characteristics often group up to neighborhood level socioeconomic information, and these are variables that I did include in my model. I also define neighborhood based on zip code tabulation areas, um, although given the limited mobility, that may be an appropriate spatial scale. So overall, by studying the neighborhood environment, this dissertation really looks at the fundamental or upstream causes of health. And as noted in the health impact model, which looks at various neighborhood interventions based on the individual effort that needs to be exerted, which goes up as you go up on the right-hand side, and the population impact, which increases as you go down, changing the neighborhood context can allow individuals aging with disability to benefit from the benefits of these interventions without having to really exert a lot of effort to do so. And we can impact a large population aging with disability at any given time. Secondly, the findings of this can inform policies that are aimed at supporting individuals in their environments and help them to age in place and allow for them to participate in their communities barrier free. This may be particularly important in light of limited financial and human resources. So if we can identify which specific aspects of the neighborhood environment are important for health and quality of care, then we can allocate those limited resources to those environmental features. And lastly, most of the work that's been done in the continuity of care literature has really focused on policies within the healthcare system to improve care fragmentation, and that largely includes payment reforms as well as use of technology. But the findings of this work suggest that perhaps we need to take a step outside of the healthcare system and also think about how features of the neighborhood environment may help us to better understand patterns of care fragmentation in this population to more fully inform our understanding of quality of care. And I'll leave my presentation here with this quote by Hugh Herr, who talks about the importance of the role of the environment in facilitating participation for individuals who have a disability. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time or any comments or feedback that you have. Thank you. Oh, and again, if anyone has like more detailed comments or wants like some time to think things through, um, please uh, float me an email afterwards and I would be happy to chat with you offline, um, either through email or we can set up a call as well. Hey, Anna, I just wanted to say that was a really great presentation and I'm going to save my comments for your actual mm -hmm. defense, but I just wanted to say that I think you're in really great shape and you should be feeling good about it. Thank you, Lindsay. And thanks, Jessica. I'll follow up with you for detailed comments. And also, if you think of anything afterwards, feel free to um, send me an email afterwards and I can put, I can chat my email in case anyone would like to send me a comment afterwards, um, really on anything. And um, when is your, when is your dissertation presentation? Um, it is on October 6th at 1 p.m. Do you want me to send you the info for that? Yeah, please. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, reach out to her if you have any other questions, and we will all plan to attend the presentation next week. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.